Uh, good afternoon, my name is Tamar Tchuszewski. It will be my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker today. And I personally, I'm personally very happy that uh, Professor Leon agreed to talk to us. He's my good friend for many, many, many years. And I would like to introduce him in 17 different ways. Of course, if you give me 17 minutes. Do we have 17 no. minutes? No. <laughs> if not, I will introduce him in only one way. But my own way. I believe that Professor De Jong is a computer scientist, but much more than a computer scientist. He's a truly transdisciplinary scholar, and a leader, and a pioneer, and a pumping power, we would say so, of the air, an area of computer science, which is called evolutionary computation. But much more than that, he's also a scholar who understands science and his own domain on a high abstract level and is able to integrate knowledge coming from various areas. The best example, he was able, able to work even with me, with an ordinary structural engineer who knows nothing about computer science, evolutionary computation, and computing in general. So, Professor De Jong has already educated one or two or three generations of young scholars in the area of computer science made tremendous impact. His book is considered a kind of Bible of uh, knowledge in the area of evolutionary computation. And I'm very happy that Professor Bayon agreed to talk to us about computational dimension of consciousness. I suppose you remember that about a year or a year and a half ago, I talked about consciousness from different perspectives. And one of my definitions was that consciousness is a complex adapted knowledge system. Oh, yes. And today we'll hear more about uh, this concept, but in, in the context of actual computer science and from the leading computer scientist who will pre provide depth and insight uh, to my uh, naive engineering understanding of my fame is only ex exceeded by his self-deprecation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm delighted to be here. I have a request, uh, at least this semester and, and, and many semesters. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday noons are all taken up with faculty meetings. So this is actually my first, uh, in fact, something else is going on while I'm here, but I, this is my first chance to uh, attend the round by evening. I would love to participate uh, in some of the So maybe we can figure out, I don't know who decides, but uh, brown bag means it has to be at lunch. And of course, everybody else tries to do the same thing. So, uh, I was also, I didn't have a very good feel for uh, the audience other than people told me it's a, it's a real mixed bag. And so my, my usual heuristic for mixed bags is to, is to have a, a set of slides which are fairly high level uh, without going into a lot of technical detail. And then, since it's a brown bag, to let the discussion uh, drive us uh, to, to different levels of detail as we want to go. So uh, I'm, not I'm not here today to talk to you about my specialty area, evolutionary computation, although it's related. Uh, really, the, what I'll be talking about today is the fact that I and several other people in the, in the computer science department focus on artificial intelligence, robotics, and so forth. And, and much of my interest and interaction with the folks uh, in psychology and neuroscience is to try to come up with better computational models of what we might call intelligence and so forth. Uh, what we're really interested in are things like creating agents, robots, software agents, and so forth, that in some sense are much more autonomous than what we have today, that, it, that have some notion uh, of, their, of their own role in the world and, and their own limitations and so on, and co can go out with relatively <coughs> high level commands or requests to do things without having to teleoperate them or without having to pre-program them and so forth. That's what we'd like to get to. Uh, and we're certainly not there yet, uh, but a lot of the ideas uh, relate very closely and uh, even more closely to this notion of, well, what do you mean by consciousness? And so so uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. So let me just give you a little bit of background, just as kind of context. Uh, 
the, the term artificial intelligence has been around for quite a while. It still generates a lot of controversy. Roger Penrose, a very famous uh, uh, physicist in England, wrote a book called The Emperor's New Mind, in which he basically just trashed the notion of, 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 of a computer being able to do anything close to what his mind can do. Uh, and Dreyfus is a, uh, uh, is a philosopher, uh, and he wrote a very strong book uh, on, on said what computers can't do. And it was very black and white as far as he was concerned, is what, what computers could do relative to what humans could do, and so on. And that, that sort of continues today. Uh, a more focused term uh, that's come into, uh, in, into play, uh, particularly in the, in the computer science and the, and the engineering community, is the notion of computational intelligence. That is, the focus here is not so much on can we build a robot and worry, worry about uh, analog and digital converters and, and, and all of that kind of stuff, but can we focus just on capturing the essence of a mind in a computational form, in, 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 in particularly in digital computation. And so what that's led to is a, a whole set of, of research agendas that have this kind of dual perspective of, first of all, if I'm putting on my cognitive science or my psychology hat uh, to try to understand the human mind by building computational models. So we have computational models uh, of things in chemistry, we have computational models of things in physics, and the question is, can we understand the mind by building a computational model? And of course, the AI and me and the, and the engineering is the other way around, and that is, can we, in fact, use these ideas, these computational models of intelligence, to create interesting and intelligent artifacts? And the two play back and forth. Okay. So at a very high level of abstraction, you have sort of two approaches to these notions of computational models of cognition. You have this sort of classic, what they would call a symbolic model, which is, which is typically the thing that you see that's dominant in AI and kind of science and psychology, where you basically are making a hypothesis that a way to represent the knowledge in your head and the kind of things that you do is to think about it in terms of symbols that are manipulated over time. So symbol manipulation systems uh, are, are what the, the, the mental model and then the, the computational model that derives from those mental models. So you have constructs, you have data structures and algorithms, and they say, this is what I mean by short-term memory. This is what I mean by episodic memory. Here's how I do learning. Here's what it means to be chunking, and so on and so forth, which are behavioral terms and, 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 and word descriptions in psychology textbooks, but they actually get implemented then in terms of specific data structures and algorithms. And then you, you test those models to see whether or not the behavioral aspects of those models uh, in any way uh, corresponds uh, to, to what, we, what we see here. So I, I'm sure some of you are aware that sort of classic examples of that is the SOAR architecture, which came out of uh, Newell's book. I, some of the folks in the field have this propensity to write rather grandiose uh, textbooks. So Newell wrote a book called A Unified Theory of Cognition, uh, already back in, I think it was in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it was a unified model, but it was so high level, it was sort of like saying the way you make money in the stock market is to buy low and sell high. I mean, who could argue with that, right? And the question then is, how do you instantiate those ideas in some sort of computational way? Uh, and the people that worked most closely with them, uh, John Laird uh, and, and Rosenblum and so forth, implemented the system they called SOAR architecture. Another person that interacted with New World was John Anderson, and he spun off a, a, sep, a second uh, a system called ACTAR. But there's some controversy as to what ACTAR means. Somebody said, well, there's, this is the ARF version, you know, version one, version two, version three uh, of, of ACTAR. I'm not really sure. Does anybody in the room know, know the real derivation for that, of what ACTAR? The first part is, is something to do with adaptive uh, cognitive theory, or adaptive, uh, something like that, ACT. So the first part has it. Uh, has it. <coughs> the flip side of that are these neural models, uh, and you see those showing up in neuroscience uh, and in, in artificial intelligence, in which what you're trying to do is come up with data structures and algorithms for representing the signaling and the connectivity and the computation that we believe goes on uh, in neural structures. 
And so the question then is, can you come up with data structure and algorithms that, that sort of capture what we mean by visual perception or short-term memory of the site? So classic examples of that, early models of, of the visual cortex. Uh, this whole notion that reinforcement learning uh, is, is, is implemented as a synaptic activity. Uh, Grossberg's art system adaptive resonance theory is a sort of classic example of, of a larger scale uh, neural model of that kind of thing. And then the AI community has been in love with what they call artificial neural networks, which are the, the emphasis on being artificial in the sense that they almost bear no resemblance, very, only a very abstract resemblance to what we really, what we know about the behavior of, of neural networks. But have been very successful in machine learning and controlling robots wandering around the, uh, the room and so on. Okay? So that's kind of the background. Uh, and, and if you look at it today, uh, what you see is a continuing sort of gap between those two points of view. That is, the high-level symbolic and behavioral mod uh, models. We continue to see progress there. A lot of progress with respect to more of the lower-level neural uh, circuit models. But we're just now starting to see some bridging of that gap. But it's still a really hard question, an open question, as to how this notion of mind, how the higher-level symbolic stuff relates to the neural activity that we have going down on the lower level. So we're starting to see uh, some hints about how to do that. Uh, one of the things that uh, Alexi and I and, and several other people at, uh, at, uh, at the President's had done is we participated in, a, in a, uh, a DARPA program called Biologically Inspired Cognitive Architectures. So the biological is the lower part and the cognitive architecture is the higher level part. And now can you, can you, can you fit those two together? Uh, and so we have our own little, what we call our BICA architecture which is an example of that, uh, based on some of the work that's, uh, that's going on in the Krasnow Institute. And in addition to that, some of you may be aware that the Krasnow Institute is, is a, a key player in a, a national initiative uh, to try to get a, a national initiative started. So we've had the Decade of the Brain, uh, we've, we've had a number of other national initiatives, and the argument right now is that the time is right to try to bridge that gap. Uh, so that's the background, that's the context that I think is important to understand. And now the question is, so what does consciousness have to do with all this? What, what's the deal here? Like, where does, where, nobody, nobody so far in any slides has said anything about consciousness. So, I don't know, is it possible to be intelligent and not be conscious? Is it possible to be conscious and not be intelligent? Are those two synonymous terms? They're, if they're not, then, then what's their relationship? What's their difference? So anybody want to step in at this point? Or you? <laughs> what do you think? Can you be intelligent and not conscious? Not sure. Yeah? Well, I, I'm always wondering that when I uh, boot a uh, computer, it awaits uh, and it does function. And so, in a way, the people say that awakening is a uh, being consciousness. Yeah, that's, that's certainly one example. And so, you know, I'm in a very primitive way because it sits there and until somebody <coughs> talks about them, you know, uh, it doesn't need to get away. But yeah. humans are often always wondering that when I go to sleep, I don't know when I go to sleep. And uh, when I wake up, only I realize that, that, oh, I am awake like that. And so I was wondering who is actually pushing the button in me like that. So I was uh, kind of uh, interested in this concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, would I would suggest that we define both terms uh, in terms of attributes and their values. And next we'll compare them. Mm -hmm. There's an overlapping or not. We may define them in such a way, and each of us has different definitions for both concepts or terms. So we may discover that there isn't an overlapping, or there is a small or large intersection. 
Okay, so that's on my next slide, is I'm trying to get you to define the consciousness. Okay. Yeah, but before I think we do that. That's that's following up on that, because as soon as I saw that, I thought, well, but is there only one type of intelligence, one, one level of consciousness, or one type of consciousness? And is it possible, if you diverge them, that there's several intelligences and several consciousnesses, that there are places where A from column one would merge with B from column two, you know, that kind of idea. Yeah. I like I, I, I'm sorry, I got a definition of Ektar, which I received from Christian Levier, who is one of the designers. Ektar stands for Adaptive Control of Thought Rational. Adapt, no, adaptive rational. Control of Thought dash, dash rational. Rational. rational? Okay, thank you. Okay. So what, well, yeah, so what, what, about, uh, what about your favorite pet? Would you call your favorite pet conscious but not intelligent? My favorite pet is my body, I guess, in terms of uh, body wisdom, which is often not a conscious factor. And my body knows how to do things, often with an extraordinary amount of wisdom, and that's a kind of intelligence. But it's beneath the uh, threshold of my self-reflective consciousness. Mm -hmm. I love to imagine going to another planet, and as you approach, you see very complicated structures, and you say, oh, there must be something really <coughs> intelligent living here. And then you land, and they're all like ants. They don't care about you, they're just going about their business. And you think about ants, ants, individual ants, you don't particularly think of them as intelligent or even conscious, but certainly the colony has attributes of those. There's a notion of collective consciousness, not just as a collective intelligence. Yeah. Is there another comment back there? Um, yeah, this doesn't answer the question, but maybe points to possibilities for the, some of the definitions. Psychologists have, have, at least one of the ways they've tried to dis define consciousness is this idea of self-awareness. So the classic little mirror test of mm -hmm. looking at animals and put a spot on their forehead, do they look in a mirror and yeah. figure out that it's on their head, right? And I've had this discussion in, with, with classes over the years and it's, it's kind of interesting to hear people talk about going through this experience with their puppies and their dogs and do they figure it out? And, do they not? And, and it seemed like something that they often come to is that, well, some of the dogs figure it out and some of them don't. And the difference between the ones that figure it out and the ones that don't seem to be the intelligent ones figure it out and the other ones don't, which makes it all circular again. I just thought, anyway, it might be an interesting way to, to uh, think about it. Okay, so you've already anticipated, uh, but let me just say it again. So, can we define consciousness any more precisely than Tom? Uh, if we're going to make these de de definitions, can we do it any more? I mean, the people have been trying to define intelligence <coughs> since the turn of the, uh, of the 20th century, early 1900s. We have IQ tests where people say, you know, they're biased and they only capture one aspect of it and so on. So there's still uh, not a very simple definition of that. And then, uh, the way the way the AI folks have kind of got around that is they they sort of said, well, for many of us, just a behavioral test of intelligence is sufficient. That is, if I observe something and it appears to behave intelligent and it interacts with me in an intelligent way, I'll just declare it to be intelligent, regardless of what's how it's designed internally. So whether it's my dog or my cat or my robot or whatever else, it's a it's it's a question of it's a behavioral <coughs> definition. So. Are there behavioral definitions of consciousness? You mentioned one, this notion of self-awareness, where you have mirror tests and so on. Okay. So it's not certainly not an idle question. Uh, people like Daniel Dennett already have, have solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> or so he claims. He says, consciousness explained. There's nothing left to talk about at this point. Uh, although we've had Dennett uh, at, at the Krasnow Institute, and, and there are a lot of things that's been uh, there's, a, there's another nice book out uh, that was written uh, either before or just after Dennett's uh, Consciousness and the Computational Mind. Uh, there's a whole conference series uh, with, that uh, Alexei and his uh, thesis advisor participated towards the science of consciousness. And even a, a little IEEE engineering magazine uh, on computational intelligence has a special issue on consciousness. So it's, a, it's, a, 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 it's, a, it's something that's in, in people's uh, focus, more fun, okay? So, now we're gonna go after a definition, okay? So, would we say that an agent is conscious if uh, it's aware of its environment? I mean, probably say yes. But, um, uh, 
do, does awareness mean that you have to have a focus of attention mechanism? That of all the things you going on in your environment, you can focus on what I'm saying or what's happening on the PowerPoint slide as opposed to what's going on on uh, boards? Does consciousness mean self-awareness? So is my favorite pet self-aware? So, how about uh, does consciousness mean that I have, I have to show the ability to make plans? think about things, evaluate alternatives. How do I get back to the engineering building? Do I take the elevator or the stairs? Let me think about that. Okay. Is that is that part of consciousness? Why is that there instead of under intelligence? Yeah. Well I'm just we're trying to figure it out, you know. We got those two terms, right? Yeah, they're and they're intertwined, right? Yeah. Can it remember and learn? Or uh, does it need to have this notion of reflection, some sort of ability to think about myself and what I'm doing and so on and so forth. Is that, the, is that, so are those last two or three things, are those AI and cognition? Or is that where it kind of blurs uh, with, the, with this notion of cognition? So it's always fun to go to the dictionary, right? And see what the dictionary says. So here are some samples. The quality or state of being aware, especially being aware of things that are happening within oneself. The state or fact of being conscious of an external object, in fact. So being aware both of internal activities and external events and so on. Okay. Awareness, especially being concerned about social or political causes. I'm not sure. But I want to go. That's a little broader than what I want. The, the state of being characterized by sensation and emotion of body. The totality of conscious states, that's kind of ducks the definition, does The normal state of conscious life, whatever that means. Ah, uh, now, the upper level of mental life in which a person is aware as, a con as contrasted with unconscious processes. Okay, so this is a little bit more like your sleep awake kind, kind of thing. A sense of one's personal or collective identity, your notion of self, including your attitudes, beliefs, and so on and so forth. So that's a pretty broad definition of consciousness, as opposed to uh, maybe some other things. Okay? So those are some, some flavors. Okay? When you look in the literature about computational notions of, uh, of intelligence, uh, what uh, consciousness what you get are primarily computer system or operating system analogies, exactly like uh, was, was brought up earlier, that this notion of uh, uh, my laptop right here, uh, sitting right here. I, I, when it was powered down, <coughs> we could call that clearly an unconscious state. However, when it's powered up, of course, it can have seizures and things like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, in a, what we would call a functional uh, kind of state. But, it's responsoring to sensory input, right? uh, the keyboard, the mouse, the wireless network, and so on. So it's aware, and it's, it's, it has sensors doing that sort of thing. Its attention right now is on rendering the, this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation. That's its attention. It's self-aware, most of our laptops are, because it's monitoring the <coughs> internal battery state, uh, temperature, the fan is going up and down as the temperature. Uh, increases and decreases, status of storage devices, and so on. So it's conscious, right? Maybe it doesn't have the kind of <clears throat> So uh, does it bother you? I mean, is that is it, that's certainly you talked about levels of intelligence or levels of consciousness. Could you imagine that consciousness is much more of a, of a spectrum, of a graded set of things? And so we have these sort of baseline things of just basic uh, awareness of what's going on. Uh, your sensory <coughs> systems are working, and you're attending to those sensory systems, and so on. And then you get to these higher levels uh, of, of, of what people also like to talk about consciousness. For example, uh, do I have to consciously think about how I'm going to get back, or do I just automatically walk back? To, to my office and so on. Uh, do I consciously evaluate alternatives? 
Uh, and then there's this ability to somehow remember or learn and so on and so forth and this notion of reflection or, 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 or metacognition. So, so to me, I don't, I don't see a way to, to insist that, that, that either they are or they aren't. I think what I, I tend to think of is much more of a spectrum. <coughs> that they're getting closer and closer to what we would call the higher level aspects of cognition. And the extent to which we're consciously involved in those higher level uh, activities. So the AI community gets at this by what they call embodied cognition. And what they mean by that is they're really talking about, I want to just not focus just on intelligence in the abstract, but we want the intelligence or the cognitive system to be inside of an agent. <clears throat> and, that, uh, <clears throat> and that agent has sensors and effectors and is appropriate, uh, that are appropriate to the environment and so forth. And the agent has some sort of goal-orientedness to it, okay. depending on what it's designed to do. And now, it's that kind of environment in which we start talking now about conscious actions and, and not being attentive and so on and so forth. So here's, here's something that, uh, that uh, Lexi put together uh, as part of, I don't know if I can do this remotely. Uh, this is a, a little example of, a, of one of the uh, slides or presentations that we gave at the end of our uh, contract uh, having to do with the BICA uh, architecture in which we had a, a, an internal model, data structures and algorithms that were representing internal mem uh, the, our, our internal notions of, 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 of short-term memory, semantic memory, and so on and so forth. Those were the, con the, the computational models. And then we had a little agent wandering around the, the, uh, a, a simulated world, and the, the sensors of the agents were bringing things into working memory. Some things were making it into, into semantic or memory and so on and so forth. And what we were trying to show is both the agent and what was going on inside the head. Uh, of the, of the it's a little hard to see because uh, I don't have it in, in the full screen mode, but let's, let's see if we can, whoops. So this is the simulated this is the simulated world over here, and the agent is just kind of wandering around the world uh, in kind of a curiosity mode. And what you've got and down here, although it's really hard to see, are various representations of what's going on inside the head of that agent. So there are things here with pretentious names like semantic memory, uh, cognitive maps, episodic memory, and so on and so forth, which uh, although we have psychological terms for those, have actual implementations in terms of uh, data structures and algorithms. And the idea here is to show an agent which wanders around the world initially and sees, uh, and, and basically is just kind of in absorption, absorption mode, where it's, it's uh, learning about the environment. But at the same time, these things are being stored in such a way that he can now use it for problem solving and planning. And so forth. So after you, you, you've built up a kind of an understanding of the world, then you're able to do things in a relatively short period of time based on what you've learned. And also the question is whether or not, for example, if there's other agents uh, in the environment, the extent to which you can do what the, uh, uh, what the cognitive scientists uh, 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 frequently refer to as theory of mind. That is, can you reason about the behavior of other agents and make decisions based on what you think they're going to do and so on. So, so that's just a very simple little uh, example uh, of, of that kind of thing. Something a little bit more, uh, a little bit uh, easier to see. You know, harder to see when the lights. Uh, is there another? Does that help? Yes. So this is something that uh, we've been doing with the Naval Research Lab over a couple of years. Uh, probably what I should do is uh, start it over here, or at least stop it. What's going on here? 
So this is an example of two robots. It, it's a little hard to see right here. This, both of the robots are identical platforms, but this one with a little collar around it has been, 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 been programmed to act like a sheep. So it's a stimulus response system. It has very low levels of consciousness in the sense that if you get too close to its personal space, it moves. Otherwise, it just sits and eats grass. And the other one here in the robot is supposed to be learning to be a sheepdog. Learning, constructing an internal model of the way this sheep behaves by playing around with it and gradually getting better and better at herding it into a fictitious pen. So and these are just video uh, of, uh, snapshots of various stages of continuous sort of learning over time, where you, you, you play out a scenario like this, and after a while you stop it and do a reset, and so on and so forth. Uh, early days with these, with these models, uh, in the early days, the robots themselves had very little computer horsepower on them, so a lot of the learning and so forth in, in these early days were, was offline. That is, there was another computer the brain of the, of, the, of the sheepdog was in a separate computer. It wasn't actually on board and so on. And so what you see it's doing is trying to figure out how to get that, to build up better and better models uh, of, of the way sheep play, uh, and then use that as part of the uh, strategy then for efficiently herding sheep. So a little example, early example, of this notion of theory of mind kind of things, where you have to learn to try to construct yourself an internal model of another agent in the environment, and then make some sense of it. So how about self-reflection? How about metacognitive capabilities? So here's a robot that uh, it turns out that these robots, uh, the, the sensors on them are fairly crude and there's a fair amount of noise in a room where there's a lot of reflecting of signals of sonar and infrared signals and so on. So it takes quite a while for the robots to get good at going through narrow spaces without bumping into something. So this is just, a, oh, it's a little hard to see. Uh, these are examples of uh, the fact that it's quite getting quite competent at going through these narrow spaces, figuring out how to do that. So now some silly graduate student comes along and sticks a little yellow sticky on what he thinks is probably the most important sensor that that robot needs in order to get through that space. Uh, and sure enough, uh, the robot says, there's something in front of me. There's something in front of me. There's something in front of me. And just kind of turns around in circles. So now the question is, without any human intervention, can the robot reflect on that and come up with an alternative strategy? So what you have to have then is an internal model of yourself and the problem, and now try to come up with a... Does it have another sense of So in order for you to understand it, you need a... It's a good question. Okay, so the way these things are designed is they have a 360 ring of sonar sensors. And the assumption was is that to get through a narrow space, it's using the sonar sensors right up, you know, in the direction it's heading, in the forward direction. And it also has a 360 ring of, of uh, infrared, but they're only good for about 12 or 18 inches, so they're not much good. Okay. And so what we've done is we've just failed the central, we put the yellow sticky over the central one, and now the question is, can you self-reflect on that? Can you adapt? To can they go backwards? These robots. They can go backwards. Yep. They can. They're. They've got. Uh, they're trying to reveal so they can. I forget what the name of that is. Uh, we have just three wheels. So you don't have to do Y turns. You can spin it. So watch really carefully. It's a little hard to see. See if you can see. Uh, whoops. <laughs> Scroll bar here. So this is what it looks like uh, with all the sensors in place. What's determined? 
charming in its motivation of wanting to go there. Right, right. So these, they have, uh, at the top level, there's a goal okay. of going to such and such a place. All right. okay. So that's that's built into there. But what they're not told is how to get there. Okay. Okay. And so what they, what they start out is they have sort of a sense of which direction do I need to go, but then they discover that there are objects in the way that they have to go down. So, so regardless of how they're pointed initially, they have to rotate around and find their way through that space. Uh, and they, uh, they get penalized from a learning point of view if, in fact, they bump into things or take too long. You know, you could imagine the robot could spin 40 times and then go through. And you say, well, you didn't need 40 times. <coughs> so that's the kind of uh, paradigm. Okay. okay, so now we find it back to where we were before. See once now if you can figure out See what it decided to do here. Watch really carefully. It stops. Oh, it's too a little hard to see. Anybody see it? So the front of the robot has it has basically three sensors that are that are pretty much the ones that are giving you information about that narrow space. And it put a yellow sticky on this one. And so what the robot did was this. Rotate its head back and forth. So that it put one of those sensors, uh, took, took, took turns putting one sensor after the other one. Does it have something like an exploratory mode as opposed to a goal-oriented mode, or is it all? This particular one was, these were just focused little vignettes. Okay, so uh, what we've got here uh, at, at, the, uh, at George Mason are indoor outdoor robots that we can outdoor robots that we can say go explore a little bit like that earlier model of Alexa. This particular one wasn't explore. It was basically you're here and we want you to go there and you figure out how to do it. Very very cool. Okay. So so what were those some examples of, of what the, like the the philosophers or the uh, kind of psychologists would call uh, theory of mind uh, and or uh, metacognitive or self-reflexive uh, reflective kind of things. So at least from a computer science point of view and from a robotics point of view, the role of consciousness here is pretty clear. Okay? That is, it has a very functional definition of consciousness. It says, this thing isn't going to go anywhere or do anything unless it's aware of its environment. It's got to be able to focus its attention on, on the things that are important. It needs to be self-aware in the sense that we were see it has to be able to make plans and look at alternative ways of getting where so forth. Uh, and it, what we'd like it to do is as you go from one scenario to another to remember what it learned the last time so it's better at what it's doing and so on. And and if it's gonna in some sense be autonomous and to be able to do things without a lot of human intervention, it's gonna have to have some kind of self See, to me, it's yeah. still a problem with definition. Yeah. And whether you're yeah. coming to it from a positivistic <clears throat> point of view. From a what? Positivism or from interpretivism. Because according to that, being self-aware from an interpretivism <clears throat> point of view, that's not, it's not self-aware yet. It's, okay. you know, from so a positive. So help us with the terminology here. Well, uh, you know, positivism is the, the scientific um, model of theory of knowing and understanding. Interpretivism would be more of like the fields of anthropology, sociology, psychology. So what is what you can observe from an external? Um, more of a behavioral. A totally behavioral, right, right. yes. That is, I haven't told you what's going on inside the black box and so on. And so right. Exactly. So I'm not sure I would agree yet that it's self-aware, but we go back to definition. So that is, to me, the, the key issue. Okay. So, so help me with the definition. Well, I don't know what the definition is. I'll tell you that in the, in the late 80s, I wrote a paper about this, about AI and whether it would ever be a truly conscious, self-aware, you know, and of course- What was, was your answer? It depends on the way, you know, this is an answer I give my students all the time. It depends. It depends on which field you're approaching it from. Let's do one at a time. Yeah. My question is that, um, so you're talking about learning also, um, you know, one of the being a uh, conscious. 
So are you expecting actually that those uh, robots will actually learn and second time they will uh, take a less time to figure out? Yeah, that, that actually was part of the experiment. That is, the way, in this particular case, you, you said to the robot, I want you, the, the experiment was was broader than, than just the self education It was, I'm going to drop you into this world, and I'm, I expect you to get from here to there. And now, the reward, think of me training you know, your dog, or training a dolphin. The reward is going to be, do you get there reasonably efficiently without knocking anything over? And the, the better you get at that, so each trial, okay, each trial, if, if I do it three times, I say, to, I say to the robot, I like that one better than that one. Okay. And so gradually, in kind of a reinforcement learning environment, a reward-based learning environment, it gradually produces the behavior that you saw on the screen. Alexei. Um, so I, I saw the robotic demonstration and this list, and this looks very impressive. But the question is, are they really related to each other? For example, I can imagine the same scenario pre-programmed in a robot in some very primitive way and happening automatically. Would you still call it conscious with the same behavior? So here we're back to the business of, is there a Turing's test for consciousness? Or, I mean, the, it's exactly the issue that, that's been talked about for uh, half a century, and that is, what do you really mean by intelligence? You know, and, and Turing finessed all that and said, if it looks intelligent, if it behaves intelligently, it's, a, it's, it's the external behavioral point of view, and as far as I'm concerned, it's intelligent. But, but you know, how do I determine that you're intelligent? I, what I don't do is I don't put you in an MRI scanner and see what's going on inside your head. It's a, it's, it's a behavioral kind of thing, right? So that, that's where he's coming from. On the other hand, as a computer scientist, I can look inside and I can see, oh, that can't, that, what, what's happening inside is just a colossal fake, <laughs> okay? Or, or as, uh, as other people, a, a classic way of describing it is to say, I can, in three lines of code, I can model an autistic person. Three lines of code are, do forever, read, and a loop. My sensory system is working, but I'm not responding. So, so you say, I can now behaviorally, I have something that behaves in a certain way, but I haven't learned anything about the root causes of autism or consciousness or, or anything else by virtue of building that particular model. You said something to me that was key. You said um, about the reward base, okay? If yeah. you remove the reward base, we get into the whole issue again that um, is reward, true reward, in, intrinsic or extrinsic? Yeah. So does that robot have any intrinsic reason for performing the task or learning another task or even you know, um, improving on the task? The one you saw didn't. However, you can imagine, you can imagine that people have been thinking about internal models uh, of, of, uh, of desire, of, of, of goal-orientedness, of curiosity, and so on and so forth. Uh, and they're not too hard to at least implement something like that uh, uh, in a computational uh, in a computational model. For, so, for example, just if I want to just do curiosity, for example, I could say, well, I'm going to curiosity can be defined to be let's explore something that I don't know anything about, okay. or or this is an area which was interesting before, so let's see if there's something else there, and so on. So, I can imagine those kinds of things. Also, we have robots now, if they're going to survive for any length of time, they have to be smart enough to recognize that they need to recharge the batteries. So they're busy doing something, and all of a sudden they say, oops, i got to go over here to the wall and back up to the wall and recharge my batteries. So, so they can have internal notions of well-being and, and, and taking care of myself, goals of that type as well. But you're reading into it that it's well-being when you know that you can just put a code in that says when you get to this level of function, you've got to go check your battery. Is that a problem? Well, again, I think it, it depends on how you come at it. Uh, you know, well, I think, right, because the point is that they're still well, supplying we know motivation and intent. The, the robot is actually not supplying it. The goal-oriented, the motivation and intent is just 
more sophisticated code is being put in that then is going to the next level, giving it the goal of survival. And it, it hasn't created that code for itself necessarily. I mean, with the medical model, we know with the human brain, we can turn things on and off by biochemically changing things or, it, or electrical impulse changing things. But what, what frustrates me about this discussion is we're still not getting to the point of the ultimate internal, you know, what, what mechanism is going on in, internally. Because with robots, it's always based on what somebody has coded into it. Not, not true, but go ahead. It is, so it's true in the following sense. Is it okay if I program a robot to learn things? But I don't, I don't know what it's gonna learn. It's still so then is it, so then what I programmed is the learning mechanism, but I haven't programmed in what it learned. Okay, but do you program it to learn and then apply it and change what it's known, yeah, what it knows? Yes, we've, we've seen that, but to what degree? And where is its ultimate motivation coming from? From what you've programmed or from the robot itself? And, and I laugh because I keep thinking of Stanislaw um, Lenz's books, The Siberian. Yeah. You know, and I think of those. I mean, uh, when I read it initially a very long time ago, I actually didn't realize they were robots, which to me was a wonderful test of how he portrayed conscious robots. So, so I'm still frustrated by that the the precision of definition. So I. Uh, can I put you uh, can I put you on hold for yes. that slide? You put me on hold for the rest of the <coughs> which, is, <laughs> which is this. So the AI rightly or wrongly, the AI community has adopted, for exactly the reason you described it, has adopted very functional and engineering definitions of intelligence. That is without trying to solve these things in the deeper sense that you're talking about. And and I'm not sure they will in any short period of time. What the, on the other hand, what's very clear, it's very clear, is that we're moving in the direction of things like teams of agents, where they have to coordinate with each other, they have to communicate with each other, they have to understand each other's roles are, and so on and so forth. Now, to me, those two things are intimately related to both cognition and some sense of con consciousness at a higher level. That is being aware of my own role and my own limitations and so on and so forth. And I can't see how I can achieve these kinds of engineering goals without having that as part of the architecture uh, of these agents. We're also in the business, uh, some of you are familiar with the business, that, that a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in using agent-based models to understand complex adaptive systems. So if you want to make, uh, if you want to understand why the economy crashed, or uh, make argue about the kinds of regulatory changes you might want to make uh, to prevent uh, another uh, a banking meltdown and so on, or trying to understand regions of conflict around the world and so on. What that means today is to do that right, you have to put inside the heads of agents something simpler than just a couple little simple behavioral if then this. You really have to have higher level models of motivation, cognition, and so forth in order to get those models to play out in any kind of realistic way. And I don't know if you've been paying much attention to Japan or not, but Japan, uh, because of its, uh, uh, of its its sort of closed immigration policies and so forth, is, is, is as a country aging much more rapidly than almost any other country in the world. And they're incredibly nervous about how they're going to keep, uh, how they're going to take care of this aging population, and they've made a national commitment to do it with robots. And so the whole notion of robots in a society is something that they're probably ten years ahead of us, collectively and socially, and so on. And again, can you imagine having healthcare robots or having uh, a transportation robots? Isn't it one of the car manufacturers now says it'll park for you? It'll do parallel parking because it's, it's too hard for humans to do. Uh, you know, or, or the whole notion of just hopping in the car and letting it drive itself uh, while, you know, like uh, you're reading the newspaper and so on. At what point in time will you be comfortable with that? What, what kind of notions of intelligence, uh, notions of self, notions of, uh, of its role in the world will have to be there before we really are comfortable uh, with those ideas. 
it's not that they're not going to come. It's a question of how they're going to come and what form they're going to take. So those are the kind of things that I see more from an engineering point of view, not from a philosophical point of view. So that, that uh, gets me to that last slide, which you already had started. So, so you have a wide spectrum of views as to, as to whether or not uh, people are, are comfortable or believe this notion. My definition of intelligence you know, is certainly not anything that's exhibited by robots today. Uh, you have the Turing model and sort of laissez-faire view that says, if it smells like a rose and it looks like a rose, let's call it a rose. And the same thing with respect to, <coughs> with respect to consciousness. So that's where I'm coming from. From more from a pragmatic definition, that is, aspects of consciousness that I think are important for me to achieve my goals. Uh, but it also raises a lot of interesting questions in some of the much deeper, more philosophical and so on. So that's all I had. Go ahead. Well, one of the more provocative talks at this uh, sort of science of consciousness conference at the University of Arizona was last time. Yep. Uh, this whole singularity thing and people's nervousness about machines reaching a point where they can invent smarter machines and we kind of get left behind. Yeah. I wonder if that's kind of part of our reluctance to, to look at this, sense that we lose control ultimately. Yeah, I'm sure it is, although a lot of people just kind of, you know, got to roll their eyes at that. Uh, I had, for a while, I had this, and I can't keep it in order, this wonderful video of the late 50s and the early 60s. The very first robot that was created at Stanford was called Shaky. And Shaky had so much intelligence that it could only move like this. <laughs> and everybody was saying, and in five years, and in 10 years, we had all these predictions about, and you know, pretty soon Shaky, you know, they'd be off and running and so on. So here we are, you know, 60 years after. <laughs> and we now have robots that move a little faster, and they're a little smarter. <laughs> Not even close to singularity. But do you believe one day it will actually take over humans? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because we're too smart. Human will always be in control of all the environment. Humans will. I didn't say that. I think what you're going to see is that you're going to see a blending. That is, you're going to see a, a greater and greater acceptance. Of, of robotic like agents in our world and in our society. In the same way, it just, just there's, a, there's a classic story in artificial intelligence where uh, a re there was a. Um, I'm sort of the blank out his name right now. There was a, a physicist who was busy at the turn of the 20th century, 1900, late, late 1800s, early 1900s, proving theorems that machines will never be able to fly. <laughs> And of course, then the Wright brothers came along, and so on and so forth. And now the question today is, do we have a machines that fly or don't? And I'll point my finger right at you and say, well, no, we don't, because they don't gracefully land on a twig in my backyard. So that's my definition of flying. Okay? The, the kind, right? But that's the point. It's your definition exactly. of flying. Right. Now, one of the things that just occurred to me is, I mean, it's possible to have a definition of, of intelligence and consciousness apply the biological forms, that's different than a definition of consciousness and intelligence by to other forms. And even within biological life forms, I mean, there are life forms that can exist, we believe, today that are not based on the carbon, yeah. you know. Um, so there would be potentially a whole new definition there. I know from, it's so I love the fact that you talked about dogs and herding, because I, I live with herding animals. You know, and I watch them, and there are people who believe that they are not intelligent, they are not conscious, and there are animal researchers who, um, you know, the test that you were talking about about uh, mirror, the mirror. mirror test. Well, there's a different test that they now do with dogs because they're not visually based. Their strongest sense is smell, and so they do a sense of awareness of self based on their sense of smell, who they are versus other things. So I mean, we're always exploring, but I think that it's possible to have different definitions for different forms. 
So different definitions, or would you say uh, a, a spectrum of definitions? Oh, let's call it a spectrum. spectrum yeah, we can like call that. it that. Right. So, for example, you know, I have this this male robin in the back, and it, 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 who lives in our woods. And every spring, he he flies against my picture window, okay, trying to get rid of that male that he sees his own reflection. So he's failing the mirror test year after year after year. And on the other hand, uh, last summer my wife and I did one of these uh, inner passageway cruises uh, along the Alaska coast. And we were introduced to the notion of whale bubble netting. Have, you, have anybody seen that stuff? I was just flabbergasted. Yeah, I mean, as a collectively, yeah. as a group, they get together underwater and release bubbles in the form of a cylinder, which, and, and the fish that they're trying to eat are, are sort of surprised or confused by the whole thing, and so they end up all being caught inside this sort of, quote, dynamically constructed bubble net. And then on signal, all the whales open their mouths and go whoosh, up to the top, and, and of course, all we see at the top is 12 or 14 whales pop out of the water with their jaws wide open. Collective fishing by a whale community. Just which to me is just incredible. And, and <laughs> yes, <coughs> mostly the philosophical <coughs> comment or yeah. <coughs> to throw in. Uh, most people would agree that consciousness is created, no matter what the definition is. Uh, a stone is not conscious, and uh, a dog is more conscious than a stone, but maybe not as conscious as we are. But we always take human being as the reference point. Have we ever investigated what would it be to be more conscious than us? Because why do we assume that we are the perfect conscious? There could be other things on another planet or we can even is it possible to imagine what would it be to be more conscious than ourselves? Or it's not possible within to imagine what something more conscious. That's a good question. You have an answer? <laughs> no, I don't have. But it's something I started to think about lately. Because uh, there may be some have. other people looking at us says, yes, you must have kind of conscious. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, but they're in order to be real conscious, conscious, they miss this and that and that. <laughs> and my question is, can, can we imagine within what would it feel like to be something more conscious than what we are? So so let me, let me put Ernie on the spot say that, that I know that, that at least in the field of physics there are people that ask the question whether or not our brains as products of this environment in this universe have the capability of understanding uh, the, the, uh, the big picture or are our own brains so limited that we, we can't see the big picture and then a, a classic example of that would be is whether we are certainly we can imagine another a human being or another alien thinking we're pretty stupid. The question is, can we imagine that? Do we, do we have the cognitive capability to think about that might be like? We do. Just look at science fiction literature. You know, I mean, minds have been exploring this for a long time, but some people don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So speaking of science fiction writers, Bernard Williams believes that the big jump that is coming is beyond our understanding. We will never be able to understand what is going to happen. Did, did I correctly characterize that? that, that, that there's, a, there's been some discussion in, in, the, in the physics community about that. Um, I'd put it more in the math department. You know, uh, British type theorems and things like that. Yeah. What, what your comment made me think of is, is uh, you know, for example, we're, our vision is limited to a pretty narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum. You could imagine putting, you know, George sure, Star Trek's glasses on and now you're aware of much more. I and see that as a more ability. No. I mean, we would have a consciousness of, you know, heat, for example, because you'd see everybody's black body radiation. And then of other things, you notice that UV radiation is not coming through the window, and that, and it's there when you're outside. And you see that as more con being more conscious. Yeah. Well, it's certainly more I was thinking aware. something more like, yeah. We were thinking of the higher level of this perception. So you're more I'm aware of things, you can use it to make more plans, etc. Yeah. Because 
I think these are all you know the giant um, the telescopes and things like that. It's an extension of a human being that uh, uh, expands our awareness about the you know universe and uh, beyond go beyond and beyond uh, uh, farther into the center of the universe or whatever like that. And so um, I think uh, that's how I think humans will eventually evolve. Uh, to be the ones that uh, we are, you know, I mean, our common people talking about uh, um, are there aliens that are smaller than us like that. So probably I think we're going that direction. Hey, I, I meant to follow up your earlier question with the other one, the other obvious direction, and that is the notion of augmented cognition, whether it be pharmacological or whether it be via an implant or, or whatever else. Maybe what we'll end up is we'll end up being hybrid machines, you know, that, that, that in fact uh, are competitive and have much higher levels of uh, Hard to see. Yes? Yeah, um, I'm at ICARP, and so even though we just kind of touched on it at the second to last slide, I think um, I'm really interested in the, the idea of how um, artificial intelligence and artificial consciousness <coughs> might be applied to conflict. Yeah. And so as you touched on that, I was thinking about all the factors that we study in conflict that would have to go into such models like the impact of culture and identity. And so as I was thinking about that, I was wondering what the benefit would be then if you need human beings to, to basically to have that input to create those programs, why wouldn't the human beings just do the work in the first place? What would be the benefit of having a machine do that work instead? Yeah. The the, the answer to that is that the mantra answer to that is the other part of that phrase was complex adaptive systems. So what it's very clear that the human brain is not very good at is seeing the second and third and fourth order nonlinear effects of, of complicated, of a complex interactions of systems. So, uh, and, and so the idea here, the, the argument is that if we build a model of that, we can under we have a better shot of understanding the time course of a complex adaptive systems in which there are these tensions and beliefs and so on. Is it more likely if we have a famine for two years to see an outbreak? Blah blah blah. And so, on. so it's the idea of playing it out over time that they use the model for. And they, we're we're just about out of time. Here's here's the classic. I, I go on the lecture circuit with, with some folks who, who are trying to convince CEOs of the, of the Fortune 500 companies that they need to buy their software about modeling complex adaptive systems. And so they say, here's a simple example, Mr. CEO. We're sitting in this room right here. Let's get rid of all the tables and chairs. And everybody stand up so you're a free moving agent. Okay? And now what I want you to do is without any external indications, Look around the room and pick a partner. Everybody done it? And now when I clap my hands, I want you to get behind the partner. And now I ask you, in your mind, tell me what this room looks like after five minutes. Describe it. That's why you need to do agent-based modeling, because if you put it in, they'll say, this is the sales pitch. If you put it in a model and you run the model, you'll say, oh, of course. But before you saw the model play out, it was very hard to anticipate. By the way, what is the answer? Chaos. No? No. <laughs> the, uh, the computer science community and mathematics community has, has, has the notion of a clique, right? That is, a, a set of nodes or individuals that are all related to each other, that are all connected to each other. So by virtue of you looking around the room, each of you randomly picking, what you've done is you've dynamically created one or more cliques. That is, there will be a, a, a group of individuals which are, are connected together by virtue of your partnership. And there are other ones that are, that are not like that at all. And so when I run the model, the virtue of getting getting close to your partner means those cliques coalesce. So after about five minutes, there will be one or more coalesced cliques in the room. 
So now that I've explained it, it's, it's fine. And so then they say, okay, well, if you got that one, then, for example, how would you design a, um, a uh, what's, what's, I'm trying to blank on the word, not a, not a dance floor, but a, uh, what, what's the actual? Ballroom? Socialization. What's the, I don't I don't do it. I don't do the bar scene. What, what's the when you go to dances and they for, for, forget it. <laughs> so suppose there were suppose there were a fire in a crowded room. How would you design the room so that people could get safely out? Now you could come up with ideas, but what people will say is, so let's try out your ideas with the model. So we'll have a relatively simple model of the way humans behave when you say fire, and so on and so on. And they've actually done building designs based on, on those models because it's easier to make predictions about it. So that's, that's the sense. That's the argument for, for, these, uh, for these models. Okay, we're, it's, it's 1.15, so I think I'm supposed to shut up, or we're supposed to leave. <laughs> so. Thank you for being here. Thank you.